UN agencies have warned that at least 500,000 people may face famine if urgent humanitarian aid is not delivered. Officials of the World, Fo World Food Programme, the Office for the Coordination of Human Affairs, that's the OCHA, and the Food and Agriculture Organization briefed the UN Security Council on the situation in Gaza. The concern was also shared by many countries which also highlighted the role played by the US in the continuation of the war. We go to Abdul for more on this. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Yet another discussion in the UN Security Council. Uh, we've talked about some of these discussions in the past where various countries have taken positions. We'll get back to that. But first of all, what were the key reports by the officials of various agencies which have been monitoring the situation in Gaza, which have been in fact trying to provide relief to Gaza? Well, Prashant, most of the agencies uh, have very clearly stated uh, during their during the United Nations Security Council meeting uh, that how uh, Israeli war in Gaza has led to a complete destruction of whatever uh, civilian infrastructure was there uh, in the Gaza, despite the uh, over a decade of blockade, Israeli blockade, and so on and so forth. And that uh, that destruction has caused a situation where today. Uh, Almost all the Palestinians who are who are displaced due to the war, and that means around two million of them are dependent on food aid, and at least a, qu a quarter of them, uh, around uh, half a million of them, are on the verge of famine. Uh, famine primarily because there is not enough uh, food uh, reaching uh, the territories, uh, uh, and and whatever is reaching, there is not enough mechanism available within the. Uh, Gaza, within Gaza to basically uh, uh, to kind of distribute uh, the food which is reaching there. So one, that the uh, the supply of food and some other humanitarian uh, uh, commodities have gone down tremendously, uh, which is not adequate to the 2 million people who are dependent on uh, food supplies and other humanitarian supplies due to the war. And uh, it is not possible uh, even uh, that whatever is reaching, which is inadequate, to distribute them at this moment, primarily because uh, because of the consistent Israeli bombings, uh, the ground offensive uh, restrictions imposed, uh, because of the destruction caused on uh, Israel, uh, there is lack of enough fuel, roads are destroyed, uh, uh, there are not enough vehicles to transport uh, whatever aid is reaching to the different corners of Gaza. And of course, there are blockades which are imposed on some parts of Gaza. For example, northern Gaza, uh, uh, the aid is not allowed uh, uh, by the Israelis. So all these restrictions and the uh, lack of infrastructure, lack of fuel, and lack of, of course, adequate uh, supply of food grains and other things. Majority of Palestinians are today are uh, depend uh, are facing some kind of starvation, some kind of food insecurity, and a large number of them, uh, more than a million of them, are on the verge of famine, as per the uh, uh, claims made by the international uh, agencies which are working on the ground. They also mentioned how their work has been impacted due to the uh, lack of funding. Uh, uh, the reduction of funding to UNRWA, the main agency, UN agency, which is responsible for the uh, taking care of the majority of the Palestinians who are refugees of 1948. Yeah. Right. Uh, could you also maybe take us to what were the views of some of the countries uh, and especially the United States? What position does it take or continue to take in this situation? Well, if you see the responses, of course, it seems there is a clear-cut division in the United Nations Security Council. Uh, there is, uh, uh, on the one side, there is Russia, China, and most of the other uh, countries uh, which which are not directly aligned to the U.S., which have clearly stated that what is happening in uh, in in Gaza is basically a prolongation of the occupation. It is attempt to genocide. There is an attempt to basically uh, kind of uh, allow Israelis to kill as many Palestinians as possible, force them into displacement, and so on and so forth. And this need to end. Most of them have repeatedly demanded immediate ceasefire, and they have basically claimed that if whatever humanitarian uh, cat catastrophe we see in Gaza is primarily due to the war. And that war, they have clearly uh, held responsible United States, which has vetoed uh, at least three times resolutions which are uh, we have be, which have been asking 
ceasefire uh, in in Gaza. So they have claimed that uh, though Israel is killing the Palestinians, it is the U.S. which basically is responsible for uh, kind of uh, not stopping uh, that uh, uh, the massacre of Palestinians, and and that has led to the deterioration of humanitarian situation as well. Uh, U.S. on the other hand has repeated uh, as it has uh, its claim that it is basically for him uh, greater humanitarian access aid access, uh, uh, wants to avoid uh, the death of Palestinians as much as possible, and has basically, but at the same time, justified uh, whatever Israel has been doing in the last four or five months in Gaza. So this is the clear cut, there is a clear cut division in the United Nations Security Council. And of course, majority of the uh, countries are in favor of immediate ceasefire and want to kind of, even Russia, for example, claim that there should be sanctions uh, against Israelis, not only because of the killing, but also because of violation of repeated violation of the United Nations Security Council resolutions, including the last, last resolution which was adopted for the greater access of the humanitarian aid uh, into the territory. And Abdul, also uh, and for, and yet another incident of uh, Israeli forces firing at Gazans who are seeking aid, which has become a very regular phenomenon as far as I understand. Could you talk a bit about that as well? Well, this is the largest incident of such uh, kind which has happened on Thursday. Uh, more than 100, as per the latest reports, more than 100 of Palestinians who gathered to basically uh, uh, in Gaza City to collect aid food aid of course as we said before most of them are starving there is not enough food available so whenever there is a food delivery or a news of food delivery people gather in large number to collect uh, food items and other humanitarian uh, essentials uh, but uh, israel has basically used uh, the gathering of palestinians to target them and that's exactly what happened uh, they fired israeli soldiers fired on the people who were gathered to collect food uh, they're uh, as per the reports, the tanks also trampled on the people who were basically uh, gathered there, who were lying on the floor because they were shot at. And uh, of course, most of the Palestinians uh, have called it uh, a cold-blooded uh, murder, and they have basically demanded that this uh, incident should be uh, uh, kind of uh, investigated at, and there should be proceedings against Israel for uh, committing war crimes. But um, as per the records uh, we have, None of these incidents have basically uh, uh, featured into the countries, uh, into the consideration of the countries which basically decide uh, the fate of uh, the uh, peace uh, in, uh, in Gaza, uh, including the US. And so far, there is no comment made by the US. Even the Israeli forces are saying they are investigating. They, they have not issued any official statement. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the largest such uh, killing uh, so far uh, into the last five years of war, uh, sorry, five months of the war in Gaza. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for that update. South Korea and the United States are set to hold their annual drills in the coming week. Reports say that this year's exercises will see twice the number of troops taking part from last year. The key focus of these exercises will, of course, be North Korea, specifically its supposed nuclear threat. The two countries have also stated that the drills are defensive in nature, although the extent of the maneuvers calls that into question. We go to Anish for more. Thank you so much, Anish, for joining us. So maybe could you first take us through some of the details of what this military exercise is and, you know, what do we expect to see in these 10 days starting from March 4th? Well, these military exercises are pretty much uh, a, a, an annual affair at, uh, right now under the UN administration. This was something that was uh, set aside or, you know, com uh, comprehensively brought down uh, in terms of its scale under the Moon Jae-in administration previously, uh, primarily because uh, a, it was obviously provocative to uh, North Korea. Very often than not, uh, the exercises tended to, uh, you know, use North Korean targets or, you know, simulate North Korean targets. Uh, and uh, that and it, it used to be a massive affair. Uh, thousands of soldiers would land. Uh, and very often it happened at the armistice border, uh, the demilitarized zone. And uh, pretty much it was like war cries pretty much on the other side of the border. No other country, like anywhere else in the world, it would have had a massive impact in tensions uh, on peace itself. And this was one of the reasons why the Moon Jae-in administration had cut down these military exercises. In fact, brought it out completely from the demilitarized zone uh, and, you know, had a more generic kind of sort of uh, military exercises with the U.S. This was completely reversed. And last year we had one of the largest exercises in about a decade 
uh, between uh, you know South Korea and the United States. Uh, yeah, South Korea is already making similar such uh, trainings with Japan already, and uh, a tri trilateral sort of uh, agreement is being pushed uh, to actually bring uh, the three countries' militaries to have you know similar set of exercises. So it's part of this uh, attempt to present uh, to the South Korean uh, people, or at least the more ultra-nationalist, uh, you know, conservative uh, constituency of the Yoon government to present themselves as some some sort of nationalist uh, that by aligning with the United States, they are trying to fend off, uh, you know, the communist regime somehow, but on, it has only accelerated tensions over the past few years, we have see, we have reported recently about how uh, this is going to this has already impacted uh, the peace process in uh, between the two Koreas. Uh, the North has already uh, made uh, proclamations uh, uh, that it does not uh, seek reunification as the ultimate goal, and it uh, deems the South Korean uh, government, the state there, the Republic of Korea, as a you know enemy, uh, as or akin to an enemy entity so these are not something that came out of nowhere these came because of multiple successive such uh, military exercises almost all of them uh, you know simulating attacks on uh, pyongyang or you know other north korean military targets or you know civilian targets even and in all of these uh, you know this sort of provocation continues to this day and we are seeing very provocative statements as well uh, by the uh, South Korean government. Uh, obviously, this is also something that is coming up in the run-up to the parliamentary election, which uh, the ruling government is expected to lose or have or is quite weak to actually face uh, against the opposition. So that is also uh, a part of the context that we need to be keeping in mind. Anish, in this context, important to ask, how has North Korea over time also responded to some of these uh, exercises? Yeah, so in as I, as I pointed out, like the biggest part of it is how the peace process has completely been derailed. Now, uh, the derailment actually happened under the Moon Jae-in government as well, but not primarily because of the North, uh, South Korean uh, actions of the South Korean government, but primarily because of the actions of the U.S. government under Trump administration, which was something that was carried out, carried forward by uh, the Biden administration as well. And now with Yoon's uh, presidency, this has only accelerated even further uh, to the point where provocations have become commonplace. Uh, we have seen, like, for instance, one of the biggest provocations were uh, these anti-North Korean propaganda pamphlets that were being shipped or, you know, uh, airdropped by conservatives from across the border, uh, something that Yoon has restarted again. Uh, on top of that, you have these exercises happening yeah. right at the demilitarized zone. Uh, again, as I said, so these are not going to be taken lightly. We are also seeing uh, plans to expand the ballistic uh, capacity by uh, the North Korean government. Uh, it has also started, uh, you know, having arms trades with Russia, something that it has avoided doing for a long time now, so at least since the Soviet Union's dissolution. Uh, this is something that the North Korean government has tried to, like arms trade with foreign entities is something that it really tried to shy away from, it, even though it was not entirely absent. It was just something that was very low-key. But right now what we've seen uh, with recent uh, Kim Putin meetings, uh, the whole point was to, you know, bring back the arms race that is already happening. Obviously, uh, their, uh, uh, their concern is obviously the fact that the South Korean side has already, you know, accelerated the arms race uh, by actually, you know, expanding the arms uh, uh, trade with the United States and also Japan, another, uh, seen as another, uh, you know, enemy entity by the North Korean government, obviously with a colonial baggage uh, or an, and a colonial history as well, something that the South Koreans, uh, or the South Korean government at least, is uh, in, it's very keen to forget at this point in time. Uh, but all of in all of this, the reaction has not been something that we should be having right now. Like the reactions have been quite, uh, you know, pretty much of anger and this provocations. If it continues, we are going to see uh, more con uh, more tensions at the very least uh, in the coming months. And that is, again, not a very good sign considering that North Korea is also a nuclear entity. It's a nuclear state and it is something that cannot be, uh, you know, uh, 
And that's something that cannot be ignored when we are talking about tensions and all sorts of provocations in the region. Anish, thank you so much for that update. And that's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meantime, do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org, follow us on all the social media platforms and if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.